Hey everyone, this is Gregory Hart. This is the Heart to Heart podcast. This is episode number four. Tonight I'm joined with a five-year paramedic in Oxford County, Ben Smith. Thank you so much for joining me, Ben. Thanks for having me, Greg. It's uh, good to be on here. I've been excited uh, since you asked me to come on here, so look forward to your little chat. No, I appreciate you coming on, man. It's awesome. I'm, I'm glad to finally sit down with someone that's a first responder and talk about kind of the things they've been going through so far with the pandemic and some of the struggles and stuff they've had to deal with so far. But before we jump into that, I wanted to touch base on how your career has went so far, where you've started, where you've come, where you've been, all the things you've had to go through just up to this point in becoming a paramedic. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I've almost five years now as a paramedic, uh, I was three and a half years as a part-timer, uh, going on two years as a full-timer now um before that I was just in the schooling and uh yeah it's been great so far uh it's something that I'm passionate about um look forward to a longer career obviously and uh the opportunities that come along with it um recently exploring some new uh like community paramedic uh we'll probably talk about that a little more later in the show uh but for now yeah it's good I uh I've learned a lot so now obviously with a global pandemic happening there's got to have been some change in the past feels weird to say, but almost a year of dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, have you noticed if you guys are receiving higher call volume, lower call volume, or what are you guys seeing on your end? Well, initially, we actually saw quite a significant decrease in call volume. And that was like probably three months at the beginning where like the full lockdown was happening. People yeah. really didn't know what was going on. People essentially wanted to avoid the hospital at all costs. So sure. we definitely did see the significant decrease there. And then uh, naturally, people still get sick with other things. We started seeing call volume come back up. Uh, the lockdown lifted and it was a little more uh, less restrictions. And then we kind of went back to status quo. Um, this time around with the lockdown, we didn't really see the same reflection. Um, whether that be that people were just still sick or whatever, but uh, we definitely are back to like our baseline and whatever i wouldn't say that we ever did actually see a hike in calls um we just kind of we're lucky we're a rural service so we're, we're quite a big service area uh, we're not like a big city obviously toronto or something it's yeah, uh, yeah. you know a big spike there is, is massive call volume but for us it was good it was manageable we never really had to, to overwork ourselves uh in that side of things now, are you seeing a lot of people call 911 or paramedic services due to covid or are you seeing it pretty much the same type of calls before. Um, and with when you saw decreasing call volume at the beginning, do you have any idea why that would be? Just people scared to go to the hospital during this or kind of realize what were big reasons to call 911 and what weren't? Well, it's kind of tough to say. Like, I think in terms of what you would classify a COVID call is essentially symptomatic. Um, so anybody who has the symptoms, you know, your cough, cold, fever, and the list goes on. Yeah, uh, we would classify that as a COVID risk call, right? So that's gone up. Uh, we definitely did these same style calls before, but we just didn't classify it as COVID. Um, in terms of people like not going to the hospital, that part of that was like procedures were postponed, and you know, regular regular visit stuff, like all the that's minor true. surgeries that elective surgeries rather, they were kind of postponed. So that was a bit of it. But then I think a lot of people were willing to take the chance that you know, my foot that's been hurting or whatever, uh, it, it can hurt for a little longer. I don't want to let the hospital get more sick there. Um, at least is what I think was the perceived general public's idea of what was going on. But uh, again, as things progressed, I think the, it kind of shifted back. Surgery started coming back. We tried to normalize everything again, uh, which has been good, obviously. I still think that it's unfortunate that we had to go through that phase, but it was definitely necessary. Yeah, I think everything so far during the pandemic has really been up in the air and no one no one really knows what to expect to come next. And with you guys, for sure, you're definitely taking it one day at a time, especially with, with your wife being a nurse and stuff. She's probably seen things on the front line as well. Um, have you noticed a big change in the protocol going to the hospital? This past uh, Wednesday, I had an x-ray. It's the first time I've been in the hospital since COVID started, um, just because my knee's been giving me a lot of trouble. But it was walk in, you have to change your mask, you're getting a new mask now. They're asking you every single symptom, even some of the stuff you don't hear from like going into a restaurant or like I've been screened before, everyone's done it, you scan it with your phone or they ask you in person. Um, but are you seeing bigger protocols for you guys as for entering the hospital or taking patients in? 
Yeah, it, we definitely have the same things. Like we're doing the whole enhanced PPE in every avenue. And I like yep. to think back at how risky we were before because, yeah. you know, we just didn't really use PPE probably like it should have been. Um, but yeah, we got now the new things like splatter screens, for instance, uh, just like at the grocery store with the shields up. I think these things are here to stay. And so I think they're the new normal. And I think that's the way that we're kind of looking at this as a whole. Like it was a change, but it's not going to change back. I think a lot like wearing masks, <clears throat> like these screens, like they're all there to protect us. And now I think we just, we have to be a little bit more diligent on that. And then, yeah, the other big change for us with some of our protocols. So we do have aerosolized, er, aerosolizing procedures, um, which we do sometimes have alternate drugs or things we can do for these people. So we're trying to avoid high risk procedures. Yeah. Um, and that's just because with us, we're walking out of the ambulance into the hospital, passing people unintentionally, but it's almost next to impossible to completely contain a person and what you're doing while you're moving them to the appropriate room. So um, if, if it's required, absolutely. We're, we're not, not helping people. We're just trying to avoid unnecessary use of that stuff. Um, so again, that those are some big changes for us. And it took a while to break old, old things, right? You kind of think, Oh, this is going on. I need to do a, and now it's okay. What about option B? So oh, for sure. uh, it, it, it seems to be good right now, uh, for the benefit of all our safety. And I think that was the big, uh, we'll take a step back. I think everything here is we got to protect ourselves as well. Um, and that was maybe something that a lot of medics kind of were a bit naive to. And most healthcare would probably admit at some areas in their career, they were not protecting themselves as much as they should have been. So, um, but like I said, these are things that I don't think are going anywhere, anywhere soon. So the after COVID or whatever you want to call it, I think will won't actually probably look much different in terms of healthcare. Yeah. Especially, yeah, with the PPE stuff you're talking about, for sure. And it's a lot of stuff that, like you mentioned, isn't something you're really going to notice that maybe should have been done until something like this happens. Like when you're seeing more of the airborne type of infection like this, obviously our generation and only some of the really older generation have ever seen a pandemic. Um, but one to this caliber as for lockdowns and PPE and um, changes in like store closings and um, everything except for uh, pretty much grocery pharmacy and hospitals has been closed. Um, I know it's a big change and it's, it's something that a lot of people I think are now realizing how good we had it um, in my opinion, just cause I just think to myself the other day, like just going on the golf course or going out for a beer with a friend or something so, so little that before you'd just be like, yeah, we can do that another time. Now you'd be thrilled yeah, exactly. to do and just wish that you could, or go see family or grandparents or certain loved ones. It's just, I can't imagine, especially with the hospital setting, you guys are seeing COVID patients, you're interacting with COVID patients, you're testing COVID patients. It's, it's gotta be, it's gotta be difficult for you guys, for sure. One of the other questions yeah. I want to ask you is, are you guys Per, like, are you personally screening these people before they get in the ambulance or you guys have dispatch doing that kind of stuff? It honestly, every person's doing it, which is probably good. So you don't miss it. Like our dispatch, yeah. they're already asking like the, the ramble of questions. So they're giving us a heads up. We've screened them positive or negative, but that doesn't inherit us from doing our own screening. So we go in and we did the same thing. Hey, I know you just got asked, but da 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 da. And then we walk in the door of the hospital and there's the questions again. So um, I, I kind of laugh. Some of these patients are by the third time. They're like, what the heck? I've already gave all these answers. But uh, the, the thing is, if you miss one, that could cause, you know, the ripple effect. And it's uh, it, it's kind of funny now because you, you start to say them so much that you, you almost get in like the habit of just saying them. And then sometimes you're like, oh, did I miss one or something? And they were changing for a while there. That was, I think that was tough too. Like it all started. It was like, have you traveled to Wuhan, China? And that was basically the only question. And then it became, you know, have you traveled outside of Canada? And then yep. the list just has gone up. Now we haven't really seen a significant change in a while. Um, I think we've about hit everything on the list at this point, but uh, it, it is, it is funny how all these questions and the same person's getting asked three, four times on the same call. Um, but back to your other point, I, like about taking the things for granted, I couldn't agree more. Like, all the things that were just simple, like 
I don't know, going to the hardware store, you know, like I, I need one screw. It, oh, whatever. I'll just run over 15 minutes. And now that is become a task to the point where maybe you're even putting it off until you're building a, a cart, for instance. Um, but yeah, the, the little luxuries, I'm excited to get back uh, to normal, of course. So, yeah, the list is something that I never really thought about because it, it did, it was for a long time. If you didn't cough or have a crazy fever, there really wasn't anything to look at, but thinking about it now, I can't, I've, I've had the symptoms once and I got tested and I was negative, but I can't imagine like you, you get a cough, somehow you get a very minor cold. Now you're getting tested. You come back negative. Now, every place you go to get screened, they're going to ask you those questions. You got to answer them. If you have the cough and you're like, I've already been tested. I'm negative. Um, I don't have the COVID or you, you hope you don't. Cause I, I have heard other sides to the test and it's not everyone. Every professional has always admitted that it's not hundred percent accurate. It has its faults, but it's something that had yeah. to be done quick. It was this pandemic hit and it was try and find a vaccine, try and find a cure, try and figure out how we're even transmitting it or passing it on to the next person. How fast is it pass on to the next person? So I, that's a good point with how much the procedures have actually changed. Cause now well, the and, that's, is, and that's strictly, yeah. And that comes with knowledge too, right? Like when we didn't know anything about what this was, I think that's again, why the first lockdown was so crazy and, and literally ghost counting everywhere because we just didn't know. We didn't know if this was, you know, as bad as Ebola, right? Like if, if this was Ebola, this would have been terrible. Um, I, I honestly think this was a, in like a nice way of saying it, it was like a really good way to like make sure we have procedures in place now. Like, okay, if we had a more deadly pandemic or whatever may be, and we For need sure. to lock things down, how are we going to do this? Are there plans in place? Uh, and it was a bit of an eye opener for everyone. And then the testing and the screening, they all kind of the same thing as we got more knowledge and what to look for and more companies were able to create testing and uh, even into the vaccines now, right? You start with one company, then you get two approved, three and so on and so on. And it, it becomes easier as we go along to either recognize what's actually happening with people, if, if it's COVID or not, how to test for it and, you know, how to protect against it as well. So it, it's forever evolving. And you know what, next week, for all I know, we could learn something new, right? Maybe it's blue eyes and you're okay. But that I think that's <laughs> something we'll look back. We'll look back in 10 years and go, if only we knew, right? So uh, it, it, it is it is evolving. And I think uh, there is some people that think it's cut and dry. Like, here's what it is. This is how we do it. But it's not quite there yet. This isn't something we have particularly dealt with in our generation, at least. Um, and you know what? Maybe we'll be better for the next one. So I think you're right with this is something that first off before you said that we'll be keeping these procedures in, there'll be more PPE going forward. Um, this isn't something that we're used to seeing. We weren't prepared for this. We weren't ready for this, but we will be more ready and more prepared if another virus like this was to ever happen. I think even like generation after generation later, I think that this will be something that gets looked back on. This is look at what happened. This is what we had to do. This is the countries that did this. This is what worked. Um, like you're seeing some countries don't have cases. They're back to normal life and they handled it a certain way. We handled it a certain way. And I'm not going to, I can't imagine being in the power to make those decisions, let alone have to implement them and be in charge of everyone's life. But I think that one of the things I've looked at is you see all these countries, and I know this is kind of an off topic thing to talk about, but you see all these countries that are spending so much money in army and war and protecting their country from other countries and not even thinking about something in their own country that could have crazy effects to uh, kill a lot of the population. Luckily with this one, and I'm not, I'm not, if I ever say luckily with this one, just like you said, it's not <laughs> that we're downplaying what the virus is. We're not saying that it wasn't, that it isn't, crazy and it's killing people and it's awful and it's putting people away from their loved ones but me and you are the same way and we have to think of how much worse this could have been oh and that's i think for me if you look at it as facts right that that's for me is everything it's it's hard to just read like information especially social media for instance and you just quickly glance over something and you see a headline that's dramatic and some sort but you don't follow up with reading into it. You could definitely fall down the wormhole. And I, I found oh, myself yeah. doing the same thing at 
at the, maybe at the first of the pandemic, I wasn't doing my due diligence to, to verify what I was feeling. And then it really hit me. I was like, I can't like somebody's beliefs isn't what I need to be going on. It's all the facts. Right. And, and you know what, every country's handling it different. Absolutely. Some countries aren't shutting down or states aren't shutting down and they may be working just fine for now, but locally. And what we've done is, and now again, this is what we have as our normal. So um, people are always going to agree or disagree. I think that everything in this uh, new society is your left or right. There's no middle, there's no gray, there's no common ground, which is uh, really unfortunate. Um, but I think we have done a good job. Like uh, we needed the lockdowns. It was, it was evident, you know, we locked it down. The numbers came down to a manageable level and then we open it up and they start going up and that's natural. I don't think anybody would be naive to say that it, that wasn't going to happen. Oh, for sure. But, uh, but what we do on the healthcare system is like take that strain off for a little bit and allow us to maybe restock PPE, for instance, maybe we can handle 110, excuse me, 110% capacity. Um, but not all the time. Maybe we can, we can do that short term, but we can't sustain that. And that's where these lockdowns come in. They, they stop it for a bit, like not totally take the foot off the gas, but just take it back to a, like a more manageable level. And uh, yeah, so it, it's been a year of this. It's, uh, it's been weird. Um, I don't think any of us have ever lived through as much restrictions as this and feeling guilty yeah. even like to, you know, oh, I would love to go out and just one time I'll be okay. It won't be me. And you know what? Most people probably will be fine. Like the, the truth, but it's the ones that aren't that, you know, kind of keep the ball rolling. So um, yeah. Yeah. Where we'll be in a year. I don't know. I'm quite, I'm excited. It's, it's brought a lot of opportunity, I think to people, um, which is kind of my positive way of looking at it, especially from our profession. So in-house we, over the last year, we gained a swab team. That was a role that we didn't have before. I was part of that for a while. Still kind of do it every now and then. We started our community paramedic program. We helped deliver flu shots this year. And again, these are all things we never did before. So these are opportunities. Public health was very busy, obviously, with the pandemic and couldn't quite meet the needs of the flu shots. So we were able to help. We stepped in and uh, who knows, maybe going forward, that's something we'll be able to help in the future. Um, so it's been a very big opportunity for us. Um, we're also the local distributor of like the PPE. Um, so that's another thing we were able, we had the space that was a role that we were willing to take on. It's awesome. It's worked out good so far. Um, so again, who knows where we'll be in a year and hopefully eventually we'll be delivering a more mass vaccination. So progression, progression through this. Yeah, man. Who would have thought we'd be right here in a year? Like I have to zoom chat you to record a <laughs> podcast. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. Thursday nights used to look a little different, but oh, yeah. here we are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. We used, used to, to do be different things in this. And drinks, but, <laughs> but here we but, are zooming. <laughs> man, that's the, that's the change in the world, man. It's, and it's these small little sacrifices that we got to make right now. And hopefully we can get back to our everyday life. Hopefully everyone can get back to their everyday life. But a lot of the things you talked about, like having the opportunity to do so many more things in the community. And obviously that brings more opportunity for you to show what you can do and show what you will do and show your managers and bosses that you're not afraid to put yourself in there, do the extra work. Um, how did you decide it, that you it, wanted to swab? Like, is that something that you thought about a little while before you did it? Well, yeah, it was kind of a shotgun decision. Um, I kind of, at the first was nervous to do it. We were really, we were given an opportunity to join the swabbing. We had a few medics sign up willingly. Um, and then obviously this was kind of that time where we didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. And they were looking for bodies. And I said, you know what, if we got the PPE, I'm, I'm protected, let's go for it. So I, I was doing that relatively full time for about four to five months over the summer at least. And, uh, it was, it was good. Like it, I had fun doing it. Uh, some days I was by myself, give my some, some independence. Other days I was mass surveillance swabbing long-term care facilities. So they were busier days, but every day was different. You really didn't know what you were getting into. And then it transitioned into like more weekly testing and where we've really honed in is helping long-term care facility nursing homes. Like with, with staffing shortages, we've been able to go in. We haven't been able to perform medical skills, but we can go in and, you know, if Sally needs a hot towel or whatever, that's something we can do. That's just somebody that's in the right place at the right time. They don't need to be specially trained for that. So we were doing what we can to help. We're in any situation really. Yeah. 
Um, but essentially that's how we got into swabbing too. The, the trailer started and uh, we were doing the mobile stuff. So we found our little niche and we weren't stepping on the toes of the trailer. We were working with the trailer and, you know, so-and-so lives at their home in, in the country and is unable to get to the trailer. How are they going to get their swab? And we naturally have the vehicles and the staff and uh, we just, that was easy for us. It was a quick transition. It was actually for sure, a lot yeah. easier to take on than a lot of us thought. Um, and then obviously the, the paperwork was a little, that was different for us because a lot of our systems are electronic. Um, all done on the computer. And when we started with the, the swabbing, it was all handheld or handwritten rather. And so it was taking more time and, you know, wow. I really learned how bad my, uh, my handwriting was, but <laughs> we got through it and then we've transitioned to a much better system. Now we can use a little, it looks like an iPhone and you can scan their health card in the yeah, I did see those. And, yeah. Yeah. It takes out the human error. Uh, there was definitely a few where the name, you know, might not be traditional or whatever. And, a letter gets missed or a birthday is put wrong and unfortunately that's how some of these swabs got missed or whatever and it, human error there's always going to be one but For sure. you know what it was a great system it worked it, it has worked it will continue to work and we still have lots of people who are now ready to, to help out now that we know a bit more about the pandemic um, Man, have, yeah. you, but have anyways, you been yeah. swabbed oh yeah 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 i've definitely been swabbed not um, a fan i w- yeah, yeah, not a fan. Not a fan. No, not a I, fan. It could be worse. It it could be like the China swabs. They're they're a bit different. So, um, anyways, the nasal swabs, they're unique. It kind of feels like water in the nose if you haven't had it before. Um, but you definitely each time you get it, you already kind of expect what you're gonna get. So it does get a little bit easier. I don't want to say it's perfect, but uh we went from, you know, at the start we were only testing if we were symptomatic. Then it became a more regular basis, you know, every couple of weeks. Now I'm getting it weekly and then it looks like we're going to be moving even more advanced uh, to about three times a week. Um, so, and that's just based on, you know, the modern styles of the, the nasal swabs and how fast you can get the results. So at that, at that uh, point, it's, to that part. at that point, it's pretty routine. You kind of know what you're getting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, again, it's one of those things that you just accept as if you're a healthcare worker in this time, uh, you have to just understand that, you're doing it to protect everyone else. So um, I hope this isn't a long-term thing, but for now it's okay. Like we're lucky it, if it catches the one that stops our whole service from being sick, that's the goal, right? Um, sure. From a logistic size, it would be a nightmare if we lost 10% of our service. Oh. So uh, if we can take one person who's sick and catch it right away, then it's done its job. And that's worth all the, the, the hassle or pain or whatever yeah, you want to yeah. call from it. Yeah, man, I was not expecting what I got. Like, I I actually came to your uh, Woodstock paramedic base. Like, it's not it. The front of the base is on Sweeberg. Yeah, Mill Street. Yeah, yeah. But you go yeah, up Mill to like Street base headquarters. seven, and 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 she comes yep. out with like just like you were saying. Like, it looks like a little iPhone. It looks like one of those like old construction site cat cell phones. Like, she just yeah, like scans built, your built card. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, like scans your yeah. card. puts She puts all your info in. Um, and then I, like, she was like, I'm assuming you do the exact same thing when you go do the road test, but like, you couldn't get something on her if you wanted to like full shield, full gown, gloves, mask, then like, like the facial, like I said, but I was not expecting what I got. Like I had seen, um, videos of people getting swabs and not being huge fans of them, but like, I just thought it was like an up stop for a couple seconds, maybe like a quick turn and down, but like, it was like, okay, we're going to go in. I'm going to let it sit there for a couple of seconds. I was like, okay. And then it went in and it stopped. And I was like, oh, this isn't so bad. At least it's coming out in a couple of seconds. She's like, now I'm going to spin it five times. And I'm like, no, <laughs> no. And like, I'm sitting there and my eyes are watering. I'm like, can barely freaking see my, my fiance's in the front seat. Cause she's getting a vaccine. A picture. Or she, she's getting her COVID test as well. She's looking at me like, I'm such a baby. I'm like crying almost this like i've got bad ear nose and throat so it wasn't fun for me regardless but get through it she yeah. goes over to her and i'm like oh hon this is not gonna be good you are not gonna like this at all she's like all right yeah well these these are things that like before this nobody was ever even if they were nose pickers you were not going that far back you're essentially tickling <laughs> the sinus right and the, you know you're going back some it, everyone's a little bit different but almost two and two and a half inches two and a half inches rather um, and you're tickling the sinus and that's what causes your eyes to run and all that. So it's a normal response. There's no, 
abnormality there or whatever. And, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it is quite a unique experience. I think everyone should try it once. That, that's uh, my, that's I think say. you should have to, if you lived yeah. during the pandemic, you should have to get that thing shoved in your nose. Like if you're yeah. going to tell your grandkids someday, like I was there during the COVID-19 pandemic, I had this thing shoved in my nose. The, the, the most embarrassing part of it is this, pa- this uh, paramedic comes out, swabs me. I'm being a baby about it. I'm telling my fiance, it's going to be the worst thing ever. She goes over to Kristen. Kristen's just like, pulls it out. <laughs> and she's just like, that wasn't so bad. I'm like, wow, really make me look like you a think she didn't freaking go minor. First, eh? Huh? <laughs> Good thing she didn't go first. <laughs> Rick, I would have had some yeah, false yeah. sense of hope. Yeah, yeah. So I've definitely, yeah. And there's good and bad ones. And, and that's just practice. And, um, you know, I've, I've done probably 1,500 of these to people. And so I've wow. kind of developed, like, using the right technique and going back far enough and without ramming it in. And I've had received <laughs> the test where it's, it's quick to the back. <laughs> and, and I think that's what scares a lot of people too, is it, it hits the back there. Whoa, there it is. But, oh, uh, and you got to find the back. Oh yeah. You like got to get gotta all the way f- back or you don't get an accurate sample. So yeah, if you don't oh. do it right, then there's no point doing it at all. Unfortunately, man, that is yeah. rough. like, I guess like that, that's with everything that's gone on so far, I'll get a COVID swab, whatever. I'll do it every, every week, three times a week would be like, my nose would be raw like my nose hurt yeah, that, for like a day after regardless <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's going to be new for us that's something we're supposed to be starting here in the next little bit once we get enough the uh, supply built up yeah. um so once that happens i'll i'll let you know how i feel <laughs> <laughs> i've i've heard it like i don't think that's just oxford county is that something that they're talking about as a whole ontario government because my cousin she works in Guelph at a nursing home and they're talking about going to three times a week. So it's really a derivative of the long-term care facilities. So for us per se, Mm. isn't necessarily, we need to be getting it three times a week for our personal safety, but it's because of the nature of the job that we're going into nursing homes, we're going into retirement homes and these high risk uh, congregate livings or whatever. So we're doing it because we're exposing ourselves to that, those facilities, not that we're just doing our regular job. So everything has been based around the long-term care facilities, whether it be the vaccinating, the swabbing, everything. And that's just because the high-risk population, right? Um, we, we know this now that they're the ones that need to be protected first the, and the most. Um, and, and we're obviously responding that way. So, For yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, during this whole thing so far, are, like, are you having a struggle with it at all at work? Like, is it are you exhausted from this or like, what's your biggest struggle so far that you're facing with, with being a pan, a paramedic during a pandemic? Ah, uh, yeah. The age old question. It, it depends on the day. Um, not day to day, but as the weather changed into winter, it was a bit darker. And I think that's for everyone. This isn't just for us, but we kind of are lucky. We're one of the, one of the professions that still gets to run. I go to work every day. I'm still socializing with people from work. Yes, I'm wearing my PPE all the time and we're doing our safe distancing at work, um, but I still get to go to work. I still get to see my, my bosses. I still talk to my coworkers when I run into them at the hospital. So I'm still getting that bit of socialism, um, which has actually been quite a benefit for me, actually. Um, I'm a very social person. Um, you know, I, I haven't been able to socialize as much as I want outside, actually pretty much nothing uh, outside of work rather. So that, that has been really a highlight. Um, but with that being said, I definitely felt myself, uh, and I see it around in some coworkers, uh, burnout. It's, um, it's COVID fatigue at this point. Um, I was feeling it in about November last year. Um, I really, I worked a lot of extra hours. wasn't taking much time off. Um, essentially I self-inflicted this one to myself. Um, but I did take some time off in December and, uh, didn't really do anything. I just didn't go to work. And, uh, and it was a nice break for me and it kind of came January or January rather. Um, I was feeling much better. I'm great spirits again and everything's fine now, but, uh, there was a time there where I was like, is this ever going to end? It was the kind of, I'm tired. I'm done with this. I need out. I need everything. And a lot of people have felt that, um, yeah. and that's just the, the COVID fatigue. So, um, it could be anything for people to be like, oh, I'm wearing all this PPE all the time. I need a break from it. I'm 
you know, I'm sweating all the time with the gowns on. I can't breathe through these masks or uh, whatever. My glasses are fogging up constantly. It's just these little uh, barriers that we keep dealing with it on call, every call. It's just constant barrier, barrier, barrier to protect us. So that's why we keep doing it. But it, again, it's just like, it would be so much easier if we didn't do that. And that's just based on what we used to do, right? So um, it, it is getting better, I think. Uh, and once we get into spring and people can just go outside again, it, it'll it'll get better. And hopefully people can start taking holidays normally again. I don't know very many of my coworkers who went away at all last year, uh, at least for long vacations or whatever. And I think we're all yeah. due for a whole service shut down and everyone go away for a week. So Yeah, I think there's got to be some kind of a... Frick, you guys need a holiday. Like you guys need your own day after this. Like I'm talking like all first responders or, or first uh, frontline workers just with like how exhausting all this is. And I do actually remember in the summer how much you were working just like, cause like there was a while there where we could actually get together backyard fire, socially distance. Even when we were allowed to have a hundred people outside, we still did the six feet apart in the backyard by the fire pl- fire pit just to have some kind of a regular or what felt like a regular night or life didn't even eat in the house, like ordered yeah. dishes and ate outside <laughs> away from each other. Like yeah, yeah, it's all the yeah. little things that obviously go a long way, but you were, you were working full time as a paramedic. You remember you got full time, then you're doing the COVID car, you're doing the COVID swabbing stations. You, you end up having the like Oxford paramedic car. You're out doing things on your own. Like I could definitely see you being burnt out by November. I'm actually surprised it took that long. I didn't hit my, like, I'm not a first responder. I was literally laid off from March till June of last year. Like I got that time to sit at home and that sucked. But now being back after this stay at home lockdown, like I just hit my, like, this is, this is, this sucks. Like I'm, I'm over it. I'm, I want normal life so bad. There's so many people I want to see. I'm so sick of being cooped up in the house. This is definitely the longest time since I've known you that we've been without seeing each other. (laughs) Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and like you're saying, you're hitting your moments now. And I think everyone hits it at a different point. Um, In the first phase, there are people who were truly locked out from going work, not seeing people may have felt it sooner. And like I said, part of that was because I was still going to work and still somewhat socializing. So it was getting me by. Um, But yeah, like it, really it it was weird we just we were all working hard we just didn't quite have the staff to still take the vacations we needed like with all the extra roles that was extra bodies you know full-timers part-timers doing extra shifts and you know you're not using your vacation time you're not calling in sick if they weren't sick not only because you had to be off for covid precaution but you just you didn't really need to right you were not sick you're not using it so um probably for the better but uh yeah yeah we'll see how 2021 treats us we're two months in and it seems to be i guess going the right direction but every you know um county every different area is so different and you know currently i'm in red and you're in orange so we'll see by the summer maybe we're in lockdown and you'll be green we don't know where this where this will take us from here so a lot lot to go yet i think we're not quite at the at the peak yet I think you're right. And hearing about a potential third stage in July is terrifying. I like people need to get outside when they can and, and and enjoy the freedom while they can. I'm not, and I'm not like suggesting that everyone goes and hangs out with a hundred people because the limit becomes a hundred people. I'm just saying like, get together with people while you can. (laughs) Like, like I know for a fact when stuff clears up enough, I'll social distance, see people, it gets me out of the house gets me from going completely crazy some kind of normal life but i i agree with you and i don't think we're gonna see to be honest with you i don't think we're ever gonna see what was normal again like i don't yeah, know it, I, don't, I don't think I don't, it should be viewed as before covid i think now we're talking after covid i think is the way of kind of changing the mindset yeah because before covid was history that that's what it is at this point and we're that's living true. through history we're con every day like whether it be through the pandemic or with the, you know, everything that happens at this point is part of this history. And I think a lot of people are ready just to know major events for a little while. But uh, holding a healthy habits and 
going through the summer, absolutely. It, it, it's easy to be outside when it's nice and beautiful. That That's a given. It's easy to visit with people outside because you can do this six feet, no problem. Um, so it, I really hope a lot of people take advantage of that this year. But again, the fear is if we have this third lockdown because of variants, um, yeah, what that will do to people, that's, that's not good, you know, for people's psych and, uh, or, or just general well-being. The stresses, the, whether it be financial or health or any avenue, it's affected so many people so differently. And it's just nobody was, nobody was untouched by how this affected you. And that was what is really unique about this. Everyone's different view of what's really going on in the pandemic, but everyone was affected in some way. So, yeah, I think you're right. And it's, it's crazy to think about something like this and everyone in the world knows about it. Like it's, it's not like something crazy happened and you bring it up to someone and it's like, Oh, really that happened. It's like, there's no one in the world. This has not affected. There's no one that doesn't know this is going on. Like, and when I remember, I I forget what the actual scenario was. Maybe it was the Spanish flu, but I, I, I do know that after it had happened, it was like, everyone was together. It had brought so many people together. It had changed the mindset of like, 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 I guess the simplest way to word it is living every day. Like it's your last kind of thing, but well, really, I mean, really, really appreciating your human that interaction, you know, whether it was simply going to the bar for drinks or going to the park with your friends to play sports, like whatever it was, it was, it was the human interaction and touch. Uh, no hugging, no handshakes, no high fives, no, uh, even when wearing a mask, no facial expression, learning how to read people's eyes. Uh, it's just not what we were used to. It really changed the way that we behave um, going forward, whether that means people become anxious when they get too close to people, I think is a real thing. Um, I know people who are saying, you know, I'm good without the crowds. I don't want people in my bubble anymore. People are gross or whatever it may be. But again, these are the things after COVID, the, the new normal that I think we're going to see pretty much worldwide i would imagine um and we'll probably be like that for a long time yeah i think that the term germaphobe is going to be more of a common used uh standard practice for a lot of people i don't think the sanitization is going anywhere anytime soon yeah these are easy things too right like at the grocery store hand pump whack hit it you're on your way you're wearing your mask no big deal um but it used to be so funny i was like you'd see somebody wearing a mask for instance and you'd be like oh are they sick or are they worried everyone else is sick what's going on here and now you see somebody without a mask and it throws you off because at least in like where i am i always see these mask people so it's not that they're wrong they're entitled to their own opinion but it's definitely the opposite spectrum where without the mask is the one standing out oh so, yeah the new normal <laughs> yeah I, I i think i've had every relative talk about how I was at the grocery store and this, this guy walks in, he's not wearing his mask and he's telling them that masks are crazy. And like the amount of videos you see of people walking into just public spaces and freaking out, like telling people that they're under control and this is a conspiracy and the vaccine is going to kill you. And all these crazy things that are like, if if the government really wanted to do something like that to us, they would just do it. They're not going to make a global pandemic happen to infect us with some kind of microchip or whatever people are going to talk about to control us. Like it just seems yeah. kind of ridiculous in a sense, but I guess no matter what. And without, it, yeah. Without getting too far into the extremists, I, I do see how it has happened though. People have been cooped up. They're relying a lot of, on the internet. Most of the time, like I said, I wasn't doing my due diligence and I'm doing my research, you know, Greg posts on Facebook that, so-and-so says that the vaccine doesn't work. Well, if I don't dig into it deeper, maybe I trust you. You're my best friend or something. And I, yep, that's the truth now. Or, you know, uh, you know, whatever it may be, right? Yeah. And these extremists have definitely been cooped up like the rest of us. And now it's the, the cap's coming off. So, um, yeah, it, it is touchy subject for sure. And I just like to say, Gray, you have your opinion. I got my opinion, right? <laughs> Aren't we allowed to do that? So true. And and social media plays such a huge part of this. And one of the biggest things I've seen since this whole thing started is I've never seen a point in history where so many people are close, yet so many people are so far apart. Like you've seen yeah. the divide with all the different things that have happened during this pandemic. 
uh, with, with Black Lives Matter, with all the different marches, with the protesting, with a lot of that stuff's going on in the States. It's definitely still happening here, but you always see it on the news as in the United States. But it, that separated so many people, but also brought so many people together. And, and stuff like this, like stuff that you wouldn't think to do unless there was a pandemic, stuff you didn't have time to do unless there was a pandemic and you didn't have anything else to do. Um, it's just, it's a really, really strange time in history where everyone just wants to be so close together yet right now is, is being forced to choose sides on the way they think about everything going on in the world. Like it's just, it's blowing my mind. I can't yeah. believe how crazy things have gone. Yeah. And, and a lot of these things are conversations that should have happened and maybe a healthier context, but yeah, I mean, like I said, when you're, when you're cooped up with your emotions and you become narrow-minded, it's, it's easy to get in your ways. And I'm sure I got my ways that I'm so, you know, this is the way, this is my truth. So yeah. I'm with it as well. But uh, yeah, it, it, when you have the sense of wanting to be connected with people and you get like-minded people together, that can be really good. And sometimes it, it isn't good. And that's how these things happen. Riots and protests and peaceful, non-peaceful, whatever the situation, people are just like-minded together uh, and, and anything, right? We're, we're only as good as we are together and our opinions uh, are our opinions and hopefully people will remember that. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what, what comes next. That's very well put that hopefully people realize that our opinions are our opinions. Like that's a hard thing. And it's, it's a hard thing to even touch on. Like definitely wouldn't jump too in depth with that or you never know where you'll end up. So it's, it is a hard time in the world to have an opinion. It's a hard, it's a, it's a time in the world where everyone is so connected through the internet and through social media and through all these different ways of, of talking to someone other than face to face that you're no longer held responsible to have that face to face um, conversation about your opinion. Like now you can just yeah. voice your opinion. Doesn't matter because either someone's just going to comment on it and tell you you're wrong or argue it with you. And then you're going to argue back and it's just going to be an online battle where there's no actual emotion. You don't know how they're talking. You don't know how they're, that's the only reason why I do the video in this podcast, because if you don't have this, you don't understand how people are trying to relay the message. You're not getting their genuine feeling other than their voice. Um, that, that, that's definitely one of the bigger reasons why I have the video option for people to watch this just because I feel like it's a better way when I watch podcasts to understand the emotion that people are trying to give when they're talking about something yeah and like i said with the mask wearing that was everything uh, oh yeah whether it means a good you know ooh, or you know wow like <laughs> they're two different emotions but when you're this high you can only see their eyes it's it's tough to read that um and i, I like to face to face myself i've always been the people person i'm yeah. glad to get together with anybody and and uh yeah you know what Hermit communities, maybe, is the way that we're going, a society of uh, homers. But uh, yeah, hopefully we can get back together sometime here and do this in person. So definitely, like with with the like right now where I am, I don't know. It's so hard to know what the rules are in every color zone just because it changes all the time. I think that's why they haven't come out with a like this is the concrete list kind of thing. But what I've read so far with this wave so far is I can have five people inside 10 people out because I'm in orange. I don't know what red is. I know that I know that restaurants are open in my area. I don't know if they are in red. You know? Yeah, you know they, are? they are. They are. It's just a reduced capacity. Now, I'm not really paying attention too in depth with it because I'm not really going out like I was before. It, to me, it's still, you know, still minimal. Do I need it or not? Like luxuries aren't quite happening yet. Um, yeah. So to me, I'm not having people over. Um, I'm, I still consider myself like a high risk just based on being around uh, potentially COVID in, in whatever. Sure. I am protected. I, I'm probably more at risk going to the grocery store, to be honest with you, because I'm, like you said, head to toe in PPE most times. Oh yeah. Um, but, but I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to have that bad rep. If it's me, for instance, that spreads the, the virus any farther. So, um, but it is open restaurants, reduced re uh, seating, not sure if it's a number or a percentage of capacity. Um, and then, yeah, like you can go to the hardware store now, which is awesome. Um, oh, yeah. so that's the one benefit you of love the that. lockdown is it, I, I am a hardware guy. I, yeah. Home, Home Depot <laughs> is where I send my mail. 
So <laughs> <laughs> if you don't go there 10 times in a weekend, did you really get anything accomplished? No, no, of course not. And the best projects are about 13 visits. So <laughs> <laughs> that's when you know at least you did it right. You got all the right parts. You weren't skimping. Yeah. You weren't you weren't you weren't half assed in anything. Um, I, I, would, t- I wouldn't be good if it wasn't uh, in town. I would probably miss it. You just order Yancey to come drop you off some lumber. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> um, <laughs> just to jump off topic here, not, not off topic for the paramedic type of thing, but just to try and leave the COVID talk a little bit, just to try and just talk about um, you being a paramedic and everything you've done and everything you've, that you will do outside of this pandemic. Um, one of the questions I had gotten asked by a friend to ask you was actually um, when you when you go to a poor call, which I obviously all the calls you go to, you're not ex- like you're not excited to be there. You know that someone's having a bad day. You know you're not there for the sniffles. You're you're there because something dramatic has happened. How do you leave a bad call and go to the next one? So everyone's different. I think it's developing a healthy habit of what works best for each. There's no, this is the rule book. This is how you handle it. For For me, um, sometimes what helps a bad call is another really in-depth call um, to like either clear my mind or whatever. Uh, I like to keep the ball rolling. Um, Not to say that when I stop and then I like take it all on at that point, but I I love what I do. Um, I know that it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Uh, when I first started, I was really naive to, to what life was, right? It's very beautiful, uh, but it can be dark sometimes. And yeah. whether that be somebody's having a bad day mentally or physically, hopefully we can help get them in the right direction. Um, I, I, I like to be there for people in the time of need. I've always been that, like, when somebody needs help, they're calling me. That's a cool. I felt, you know, when I was starting, I was like, I'm a superhero. Like, I'm going to, to help them, right? <laughs> And I still get these feelings where I'm like, okay, what can I do for you? Can I help? And the amount of times that people don't even have to say thank you, but you can see it, the stress has come down or or whatever, you've explained something to them or, you know, whatever it may be. It could be something as simple as grandma is having a bad day, but her, she's not wearing socks. So if I put the socks on her, that's something they're going to remember that I did that goes a long way, right? It's a little subtleties along the way. Yeah. Yeah. But when, when there's bad calls, we have like people to talk to. And that's the biggest thing. If it's bugging you, talk to people about it. Within the service, there's hotlines. Um, pretty much anyone in the healthcare field has an ear. Um, no, nobody's going to tell you that they've never been in a situation uh, where they've maybe thought about something a little longer or whatever else. That's normal. We're human. We're responding to abnormal things, right? Um, we're not necessarily built to be doing this full time. But with healthy habits and, and going forward, you, you can be okay to, to do these things. Um, but, uh, and every, everyone's different. I, you know, for one small thing to me could be big to somebody else and something big to them could be small to me. So uh, like I said, there's no rules on it. Um, but for me personally, it, it's definitely keep going and yeah, do your best. It, we're all human. Man, I think you, I think you touch base um, with, you have an outlet, you have someone to talk to. If it's something that you can't stop thinking about, go talk about it. I think that's a great tip for anyone. Like, I think that that's really good for first responders and I'm glad that they have that outlet. And that's definitely an outlet that I'm, I believe is covered by being a first responder. And it, if it isn't, it definitely should be. Um, but th- that's something that I don't think I ever really looked at clearly until a couple of years ago like until you have something like like what you see you were naive you went to your first like major call and it was like holy crap um this is what I, like i know you weren't thinking i'm never gonna see blood i'm never gonna see gore i'm never gonna see these sure. bad things yeah but you don't you can't anticipate the exact thing you're gonna see and you definitely can't be taught how you're going to handle when you first see it. You don't know, but I do yeah, believe you really don't No, definitely not. And I believe a lot more people should reach out about that kind of stuff. Like mental health is, I, and I was naive to that. I was so naive to that a couple of years ago, like you hit tragedy, just like you saw it in your career. And for some reason it flips that switch, something tragic enough happens and it flips that switch to where it's like, 
you're not weak for being upset. You're not weak for needing help. You're no, not weak no, no, no. For needing to talk to anyone. Like, and and I think that's huge with the first responders because I was on the fire department for a very short lived time, just with things that happened in my life. It wasn't right for me at the time, but I had talked to a lot of volunteer firefighters that had seen awful, awful things, like whether or not it's children or I'm not going to go into depth. It doesn't even matter. No matter what it is, they had to talk to someone and they still have hard days, like where it's just, Oh yeah. You might go to a call that was some people become their new normal. Yeah, Yeah. like the the way that they cope with it is it's maybe sometimes something triggers the thought and that's their new normal. But it's coping with that again that new normal for sure. Um, But again, first responders and military or whatever that have been brought to light with PTSD and conversations like that is the flagship for a lot of people. It doesn't mean that because you're not in these industries, you can't have something traumatic in your life happen. I, I always think in my life that when I'm going to these calls, they're having a worse day than I am. Like the family, the, the people that are involved before we get there. We definitely get generally a few minutes to what am I going to, you wrap your head around it. It doesn't mean that you're not invincible to it, but you sometimes have that chance to, oh my, we're going to this, get my head straight. What might I see? where unfortunately sometimes in the public and families, they don't have that warning and they find something or see something that they didn't want to and didn't intend. They didn't sign up for it. And, and that's, that's the people I feel bad for. Um, the ones that are stuck in that situation that didn't ask for it. Um, and I'm not saying we asked for it either, but for we sure, definitely but... take that risk with the job. And that's, yeah. and that's the nature of it. Now, yeah, yeah. talking to people has it, it, been a game changer. Um, I'm lucky I haven't been through anything super traumatic yet, but I know lots of people have, and I've talked to them. How have you dealt with it? And how have you coped with it? So in the event that I find myself in that spot, what should I do? What should I look for? And hopefully they recognize it if something's off in me too. And that's, and that's kind of like the nice part about being a, a, what I would call a family service. I know everyone in the service by name. I almost know everyone, how many kids they have, like, it's really nice that way. So you can see when something's off. Right. Yeah. Um, and hopefully deal with it before it becomes a bigger problem. And uh, yeah, it's, it's not for everyone that this job is definitely not for everyone. Most people probably not at all. Um, but there's lots of jobs. That's not for me I'm sitting at a desk and no, I'm good. <laughs> I will definitely not succeed in life if that's my, uh, my <laughs> job, but that's me personally. Yeah. So. Yeah. Everyone has their outlook and, and you were pretty, you knew where you wanted to be and when you wanted to be like you, did you not leave straight to Sault Ste. Marie right out of high school? Yeah. So yeah. Anyways, a little back history there. I, I went to Ingersoll, went to high school. When I left high school, I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. Um, so my wife, uh, my girlfriend at the time even was going up North. She went to Sault Ste. Marie. She was taking the nursing program. So I tagged along and I took free health. <laughs> really exciting stuff. Uh, I knew I kind of wanted healthcare, but I wasn't sure where yet. So that was my entryway into it. Once I got there, met a few people, started thinking like, do I really want to be hospital clinic, nursing home? Like what avenue, whatever. Um, and to me, it was like, you know what? I kind of like the idea of like in an ambulance, it's healthcare, but you leave the hospital. I've never really been a huge fan of hospitals as weird as that sounds, but um, no, I I'm like not. taking people there. That's fine. But I, I like to leave as well myself. So it kind of went hand in hand and uh, I had a bit of experience like seeing first responders. My dad's a firefighter, you know that, and yep. sure, most people will know that. But so growing up, it was, it was secondhand, you know, the pager went off, he went, sometimes I was in the car when he got his call. So I went to see a car accident or something. And um, so I kind of had a taste of that in my blood and uh, it was, you know, from there, it was almost history. And um, once I started the program, did my first couple actual road shifts, it was, it was a no brainer. Yeah, honestly, I don't know what I would be doing now. I, I couldn't see my life any other way at this point. So no, I think you were destined to do what you're doing right now. I don't know, like knowing you for as long as I have, and there was, there was obviously some gaps there with school and life changes and where people went and what people were doing. But yeah, I don't see you I cannot imagine you sitting at a desk. <laughs> yeah. You'd be going crazy. Man. No, I'm not a desk person. No, uh, which is funny because actually my current role is I'm doing a community, me- compu- uh, 
get my words straight here, community paramedic position. And uh -huh. actually I'm taking on a lot more logistical side of things, scheduling, uh, making appointments with people, things that I didn't really do before. I didn't do these, like I paid your one off, respond to the call. That was about as basic as it got. Now I'm calling, following up with people and I'm really enjoying this. This has actually been a game changer for me. Um, it, the way that we're doing our rotation right now is uh, quite a healthy rotation for me. It's two months on the road doing 911 normal job. And then one month, which I'm currently in, is doing this in home visits with chronically ill, palliative care patients, visiting people in non emergency, emergency for them, but not emergency department. Yeah, Waterloo's say. doing that and right now too. Absolutely. It is. I, Within 10 years, this will be the way that paramedics is primarily based around, in my opinion. There's always going to be the 911 emergency right now. That's not going anywhere. But I think we're, as a career we're developing, we're still a very young profession and kind of learning our, our crack and where we fit in. And again, based on our nature of wanting to help out and with the pandemic, where can we help out? For we sure, kinda, yeah. We're natural at just learning these new skills and going with it. So um, it's been great. I've been really enjoying this and uh, it, yeah, whether I can do it full time, I'm not sure, but like I said, the rotation is, is awesome. So is that relatively new? Yeah. So that's, again, this is a program that started through the pandemic, not because of the pandemic, but yeah, yeah. they went hand in hand about a year ago. And uh, yeah, it started with uh, what, what we can, what can we do here? We're community paramedics. What does that mean? So then we, we started getting some doctors that were like, can you visit these palliative care patients? Now, palliative meaning pain, not uh, terminal, which is a yeah, yeah. quick misconception. But so we started helping palliative care patients. That was awesome. We were going home in their home when they were, who do I call? It's either you or 911. That's the way it used to be. What do I do? I can't fix my pain. So it was call 911. So we stopped getting a lot of those calls, which is awesome. They're, they want to stay home. We want them to stay home. That's their goal. Let's do it. So we started with that and then we started picking up more stuff. Like we're not taking over any profession. We're just helping out, like kind of feeding the cracks, right? If somebody's falling through the system, maybe we can help point them in the right direction. Yep. And again, these are a lot more long-term chronic people. We get to know them. We have, you know, big backlog history. They know us by name. We know them by name, um, which is insane for paramedics because we used to be 15 minutes. Nice to meet you. Good luck. <laughs> right no no so, I, I and I remember you you've talked to me about that like never you've never talked to me like I'm not me and you've talked to me about who they are but you have explained yeah. a couple of stories where it's like dude it felt so good to just help this person get some kind of a relief obviously with having palliative people um there is a lot of them that are close to death or are waiting for that day or that call and you yeah. have explained a lot of the stuff that you make their final days easier, less painful, someone to talk to. You've said you've been there where it's your job isn't there, isn't there to sit there and talk to them, but you know, they don't have long. They're just, they're happy to see a young guy and, and hear about his life. And you've told me some of those stories. The amount of times that I can go in there. And if, if it means that, you know, the, the daughter, for instance, is stressed out to the max, she can't handle it. She's worried that so-and-so is going to have to go to the hospital. If I can get her calmed down, make her a tea, whatever it may be, and help with his pain or whatever the situation may be, then I've de-escalated the whole situation. We're getting these calls when they're at the peak of, I don't know what else to do. I like, I'm going to break, something's going to go wrong here and they're going to end up in the hospital. And that's not the goal. Yeah. So it, it's amazing how, how little, just a quick conversation or, Hey, I'll watch them. You go have a shower. You haven't showered in three days or you're helping everyone else, right? It's not just the person um, it's, it's usually a big family. Like these are moments, like you said, primarily it's end of life stuff and the, everyone wants to be there as much as possible. So everyone's stretching themselves thin overworking and the goal wants to be stay home, but they don't know how to make that happen. And hopefully we can answer some of these questions for them. And it's been really satisfying for me. Um, whether it be the, I'm there for the last moment, um, which has been my role. Sometimes I hold a tissue box. If that's what it means, that's my job. Or if they're in a crisis with pain, if I can help them, awesome. Like yeah. I'm only there, I, the way we talk about it, and I love the description, I, I couldn't explain it any better, is you tell me the destination and I'll be the GPS. I'm just gonna try and get you to where your goal is, right? 
So if you mean I want to stay home because my back hurts and I don't want to go to the hospital, let's try and fix the back pain. Keep you here. If you want to go to the hospital, I'll call you an ambulance. Let's go to the hospital. Whatever you want. Let's let's get you there. I think so. it's a great. I think it's a great idea. I think that a lot of people don't know it exists yet. Uh, as you said, it's very new. And if you remember Chris, Kristen's neighbor, yep. he his wife just started with that position in Waterloo. It's a very new position. And they're just starting to do like two or three rolls in it, but she's really enjoying it too. And I don't know about you, but if I was on my last month or week or half, six months, I don't want to go anywhere but home. Yeah. It, it's like the most common thing you hear, you ask anybody healthy or not, you say, you know, what, what's your plan? Do you want to be home? Do you want to go to hospital? Do you want to go to hospice? What, what is it? Most people would be like, I want to go or stay at home. Right. I want to die at home. And that's, that's a common thing, but it's really hard to make that happen when it's happening. These are For things sure. that, you know, hopefully we can get involved early enough in the process that we can have these like plans in place. So we're not stuck going, ah, there's nothing we can do. You have to go to the hospital. That's, that's, I hate that. I don't, that's what we try to avoid at all costs. And it, it's fun how sometimes you get to saying, okay, we can keep you here. It's going to be a little weird, but we're going to do this, 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 and you can stay. <laughs> and and with, so, with people passing too, like, like if, if they've signed up to be a DNR and, and you know, they're going to pass away within a couple of weeks at that point, you just let them go or you're required to try and work on them. Like, does it depend on what they, where they are in their, in their state? So DNR and for people watching that don't know is do not resuscitate order. Um, it, anybody who generally has chronic illness or expected death is coming or whatever can sign up for this. Uh, it has to be signed off by a medical professional, doctor, or a registered nurse, um, saying that, yep, that they were able, like they're, they were clear-minded when they made this decision. And essentially, it just means that if, if they were to, to die, that we wouldn't have to intervene physically doing CPR, defibrillation, that kind of stuff. And that, these are conversations that are had when we're dealing with these palliative patients. Like I said, they're mostly end of life, not always, yeah. but we're not the, generally the first people that are breaking the news to them. That's what's going on. They've had these conversations before and it actually makes it really easy to communicate with them. Use the words. Like if, if they have cancer, it's cancer is now their new word. Like they, that's a word in their vocabulary. So For use sure, yeah. those words. It helps them understand. And it really changes the way you look at it when you're like, okay, I'm not breaking the news to them. It's not me. I'm just here to help them with their problems. But yeah, so do not resuscitate is a very important thing in these situations because most of them say, "I'm I'm terminal. They're, this is my end here, and don't be heroic on me." Um, and and that's that's fair. Everyone's entitled to their decision. So if they For don't sure. want it, we can't force it on them either. So everyone gets that choice. And you never know how you're gonna come back. Like if you if you are terminally ill and you have a heart attack or Whatever it may be, being resuscitated, you never know the state you're going to be when you are brought back. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, it's a big life change. And starting with paramedics is, for me, was dying with, dig dying with dignity. That's important to me. So, if my end diagnosis is terminally ill with some sort, does that mean I want my family to witness resuscitation efforts? Well, I could be peaceful in bed, music playing, window open obviously the inevitable is going to happen there. There's no secret there when you're dealing with terminally ill patients, yeah. it's how do you want the lasting memory to be? And that that's why I think dying with dignity, right? I've made the decision. I don't want people to see me like that. And if I'm a very big advocate for this stuff. So, I mean, I could talk for hours about it. It's uh, it's been something that's changed me as a person. It, it definitely for the better. I hope to continue to grow into this role and, uh, and we'll see where, where we go. And like I said, it's fairly new. I've done three rotations of it now, and um, I'm still learning every day. Today I was doing it. I learned something new. So we'll see what tomorrow brings. <laughs> Man, you've always been like that, though, regardless of what it is when you're picking up some difference. Like I remember at one point because the the I believe and correct me if I'm wrong with with your paramedic service, it's based on the amount of hours you've put in, not how long you've been there. Correct from transitioning to, from part-time to full-time yes yeah yeah so it's it's hour based not higher days yeah like i remember when you first got into this like 
there was nothing that would stop you from taking a call in. Like we'd be sitting there playing cards, haven't even cracked a beer yet. And it's like, Hey, can you work at 6am? Yep. Everyone cards are away. I'm going to bed. It was like, (laughs) there was no getting you out of it. There's still no getting you out of it, but like, it's like, (laughs) you've always been very into your work. You've always committed very hard to your work. You've like with the swab thing too. I remember how much you, not that you enjoyed doing it, but you enjoyed that change of pace. You're still in that career choice, but it's, it's something new. It's like, it's like where you said you weren't going to be happy at a desk, but now you're doing this kind of stuff. You're doing a little more paperwork, doing a little more sitting around planning stuff for the people that you're taking care of. And, and it's hard because I, for some reason, when I think about that system, I think of it as depressing and very good. Like, like not in like a, it's very awesome that they offer that to people who are terminally ill and anyone that really needs the extra help. It's nice. That they're not alone. They're not in pain. And I tell you right now, if I'm ever in that state, I want to be in my lazy boy looking at the view I've looked at for however long I've lived at the place I'm at. And I just want to be comfortable well, exactly. in my own home with people I love. Yeah. Like, so yeah, it, that, it, that's, it's, it's a, it was a challenge, right? I, like you were saying, back to the swabbing thing. I didn't ne- initially want to do it. I was nervous about doing it because of the pandemic. I did it. It was a great opportunity. I learned a lot of skills, a lot of ways. I'm talking with different people I normally wouldn't talk to. Um, it was great. And then this came along and I'm like, yes, I kind of thought I wanted to try it. So I threw my name in the hat um, and was lucky enough to, to get it. So um, I was working a lot with some of our management with the swabbing stuff. So I was already kind of in their eyes when this rolled out. So uh, I was like, ah, come on, I really want to try it. And they gave me a chance and it's, it's been great for me. And um, yeah, definitely interesting being on a different side of them. what hat are you wearing that day? Like in a, in a 911, if somebody dies and they're not, you know, with a DNR or whatever, then that means do something. You legally are held responsible. You have to do something where when I'm with the palliative care team or excuse me, uh, with these patients, uh, it's take a step back. You know what? It's not my show to run. It's let the family cope, help where you can. Like, and as weird as it sounds, it's sometimes a beautiful moment. Like a lot of my last two, uh, that I've dealt with, the families have actually been relieved and, um, you can see the stress that initially, of course, everyone's sad. It's, it's, you're losing somebody you love, but it's also sometimes no longer suffering. And, and a lot of people see relief in that a few, not even days, just a few hours or moments after they go, okay, it's over, right? It's no more suffering. It's let's rebuild now. Um, so yeah, in a weird way, it is kind of a beautiful moment to be part of. It's not like, I'm, I'm assuming when you started this career, it wasn't that you were like, man, I hope someday I just get to work with people that are, that are on their way out. They've only got a couple months to live. Like that's got to, I, I love the fact that you're pulling every positive aspect of that position out, which is, which means you're definitely the right person to stay in it and continue to do that position. Um, especially cause you'll, like you explained, you'll make a T for someone if that's what it's going to take to get them less stressed and be happier or have that little bit of relief. Like that's your, that's your, that's your goal. That's your target. Um, but there's gotta, like, I can't, I I don't, I don't think I could do it. I think I would love to be able to help someone in any way I possibly could. That's definitely part of me. But when it comes to just meeting someone and getting to know them and have like feel for them and respect them and hear about their life and have them in their most, their hardest time they're ever going to go, the hardest time they're ever going to have. And the last time they're ever going to have, it just, I think there's enough pressure on being a paramedic when you're showing up to a call and you got to try and save someone's life or save someone's day or make someone feel better. or I don't know, whatever it may be, give someone some yeah. kind of relief. I, I can't imagine just knowing that this person you're helping is, is gone. It's inevitable. They're not living much longer. They're, this is, this is all they got. I, I, that, I think it would put a bigger toll on me that I, that's probably why I'm not a paramedic, but um (laughs) that's what i mean it's not for everyone and again now me five years ago in terms of maturity that wasn't me five years ago either you know this this career does things to you both positive and negative uh you know you'll hear the words dark humor and you'll hear things like 
I've seen some stuff uh, or whatever the phrase yeah, may no, be. For sure. But with that comes personal development as well. You've learned to cope with certain things. You've, you've seen some things and how they should go and how they shouldn't go. And that's just where the experience and, and, and goals change, right? So for me with this, it's like five years ago, there was no chance I was in there. First, I wouldn't know what to say. I'd have my foot in my mouth before I know it. And <laughs> now I'm, I feel like not a natural. I've always got room to, to grow, but I'm not as afraid to go in there anymore. I think fear is gone. It's, it's, this is the situation. Let's go. <laughs> Where before I definitely would have been a little more, well, okay, give me a second. I got to figure out what I'm going to say or plan for the moment. It, it, it's a natural thing and you're going to be part of it. Eventually I'll probably, I'll have that foot and mouth moment. Uh, again, for human things happen. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Especially with trying to think about what you're going to say and what you're going to do it. I know this is obviously a completely different atmosphere, but it's like what I'm doing right now. Like what, like my first episode, didn't know what to say, wrote a million things down on a piece of paper, thought about questions days and days before thought about what I was going to say, what I was going to do. And the podcast went good. And George was an amazing guest, but it was, it was me constantly trying to keep the conversation going with a new topic, trying to ask more and more and more and more things. And the reason why I'm bringing that up is because I could see that being you if you did this four years ago it's like how do i take his mind off of obviously passing away how do i talk about something else how do i not bring this up or talk about this and now i'm doing this one and i'm I'm four episodes in and this one i'm more focused on bouncing off of what you're saying and continuing to like just literally making it a conversation that's all this has ever supposed to been this is all i've ever wanted nobody's an expert the conversation yeah nobody's an expert to start right we're all gonna like learn blunder and you know what? I always thought of it as like, oh my goodness, I was afraid to make a mistake. I'm dealing with people's lives and stuff like that. But if you can make a, oops, I said something wrong mistake. These are in the grand scheme of things, they're minor. And hopefully you can laugh about it. You don't hurt their feelings or something. You didn't mean to say it or whatever, but you know what? Every job has its things, whether I don't want pickles on my burger and I get pickles. <laughs> it, oh, these things happen. It's so true. like I said, it, it these are learning. You're, you're going to do it with the podcast too. It's a great setup. I love that you brought me on here. I'm hoping that I've uh, met your expectations, but you know yeah. what? 10 pos- podcasts from now, I'm sure if we had the same conversation, it would go a different way and maybe better, right? It'll happen again. I'm sure it will. Yeah, yeah. Especially how your career changes and things change. And when this pandemic ends, I'd love to talk about it again and just see where we've come and what things have done. And obviously when things open up a little more, uh, have you in person. And I think this is a, I think this is a good spot to, to end this out. And I, uh, I really do appreciate you coming on here. I've got nothing but respect for you and, and the, the career choice you've chosen and the stuff you've done with it so far. I've always, I've never had a bad thing to say about your work ethic and everything you have to do with your career. And um, I appreciate you coming on here and, and, and expressing some of the stuff you've been through. I know it'll bring some, maybe not relief, but at least there's a lot of people out there that you're right. All they see is the the Facebook post of this is what's happening or this is what's happening. What do I believe? What's going on? You're a frontline worker. You're a paramedic. You've been swapping people. You're seeing the changes. You, you yourself are having to adapt to all the changes and things that are happening in the world. And I think that if it's not relief, I think it'll be something good that this will come if people watch it and see your side of things and see that just like you said, you're on your way to a call and someone's having a lot worse day than you. And I think that if everyone had that kind of mindset with stuff in life, I think the world would be a little more of a peaceful place. So I think we should end it there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you've got anything else you wanted to say. No, I just, again, thanks for having me uh, again. Next time we do this, it'll be across from the table and uh, maybe we'll have a beer with it. Who knows? So that'd be nice, man. That'd be a good change. Um, so Again, this is the Heart to Heart podcast. This is episode four. This has been Ben Smith, a paramedic in Oxford County for over five years. Thanks so much for watching. See you, Ben. Ciao.